mark the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Some Pharisees came and to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, when God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now people were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. For truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. But it had come to the point where it was so easy to do to dismiss somebody for 
the slightest infraction. So as always when this happened, when, when the pendulum sweeps way over here, right? Jesus has got to pull it way over to the other side. And he shocks his hearers by saying, get divorced, we married. Okay, you commit adultery. And he even throws the thing in reverse of a woman divorcing her husband. So much less heard of during Jesus' time, but he throws it in just in case the women think they're going to get away with something. Now let's look at this whole thing in the context of the whole scripture. I was brought up Catholic. And I had an aunt who married a no cooter. He would take the money that he earned and he would go straight to Narragansett Racetrack in Rhode Island and he'd blow it. And finally, when they had no money to pay the rent, I've had enough, she said. And both of them being married Catholic, she finally said, I've had enough. I'm not, I, I can't take this. I can't take these, these notices and shutoffs of electricity. And she divorced him. And she went to her parish priest and said, well, this is most sad, of course, but uh, try not to remarry. Uh, and, but she did anyway. And she married the nicest guy. This, this, this uncle I loved him. I thought, why didn't you find him first? <laughs> no. But she maintained her belief in her faith. And she went to Mass every Sunday. Unfortunately, she couldn't go to communion. So, on the one hand, she was living under the rule that said you can't miss Mass, and if you do, you commit a mortal sin. So she didn't want to commit a mortal sin, so she went to church. But she would watch people go up to communion, which had been part of her life for so long, and felt like a total outsider. Now, this is because we look at the text in the terms of Jesus going far away from the liberalism, so to speak, of the Pharisees. Nevertheless, it's all so easy to talk about all of this stuff because I think, unless I am wrong, most every family has been touched in one way or another by divorce. And as a result, it is a sign that we are dealing with imperfect people. And the church always warns divorce because something that started off good somehow didn't quite make it. And that in itself is a cause for great, great sadness. So what shall we do with all of this today? Well, Martin Luther said, and you look at a text, don't just stay there. Think of everything you've ever learned about the Gospels and start putting it together. So, why don't we start with the big one? Jesus said to his disciples, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Want to try it? I don't think so. So why does he swing the pendulum so far? Because the goal has to be further than we think it should be or we don't strive in the way we should. Or consider the rich man that came to Jesus and said, what must I do for eternal life? And Jesus says, give your money away, follow me. And the young man went away very sad. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, ah, how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they open mouth, look at him and say, well then who can they be saved? Because absolutely, during Jesus' time, if you were rich, God liked you. God liked you, and he was blessing you. Remember the story of Job? You know, he went through all these trials and tribulations, and he came out good, and God said, oh, I'll give everything back to you, oh, you're great. And so they look at Jesus and say, how can this be? And here it comes. He says, with people, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So when we come to a text like this, we have to say to ourselves, are there other texts and what other things Jesus said that address what is going on in this text this morning? Because if we don't, then we become the type of people who will want to condemn people who in the beginning, really thought they were going to have something good. And something tragic happens, and it just doesn't work. But that's life, isn't it? Not everything works. Plus the fact, at least in my experience, of doing an awful lot of weddings, and talking to an awful lot of people who want to get married, I 
met some people who I want to say, don't do this. <laughs> Please don't do this. Or a very young couple. They haven't even reached uh, tw what, 20 yet. And then in this experience, not only do they show up, but they bring their mothers for a premarital. They thought, why are they here? Well, they went out to the church and decided how they were going to rearrange all the pews and move the baptism font. They're going to do all these wonderful things where the banks of flowers are going. And they come back and they sit. I'm waiting for them. And one of them is carrying this very thick book. And on the front of this says, The Guide to the Perfect Marriage. And I look at it and I want to tremble. For the next 15 minutes, the only two people who talked to me were the mothers. As this young couple sat on a sofa looking around like scared little church mice. And I thought, what do I do? So finally I looked at the young couple and I said, you know, maybe what might be good is if you can come back here and leave your mommy's home. I never saw them again. <laughs> never saw them again. Or the couple who called me up and said, we saw your church, we love it. It was St. Paul's, Wethersfield, Connecticut, Claire. They said, oh, a pretty church. We'd like to get married there. I said, really, why did you choose our church? Oh, I don't know, it just kind of looks so nice. And I said, what's your name? And her name was Mary O'Flaherty. I said, what's your fiance's name? <coughs> Guido Romano. I said, okay, which one is you, Catholic? And she goes, how do you know? Oh. I said, you've both been married before. Well, yeah, okay, all right. So I, mean, I know what they're up to. You didn't get kind of a second sense. Or the other couple that came and, you know, well, we've been married before, but for this time, we've really fallen in love. We are in love with each other. And they come in and I said, well, why don't you tell me, I said to the woman, tell me about the marriage that failed. And she said, which one? <laughs> I said, oh, man. I look at him and I say, you? He goes, three. I said, I'm not sure if I can do this. And they're very upset with me. And they leave and they go down four miles down from where I am to the Methodist church and they get married. And of course they divorce and a year later. For whatever reason they wanted to get married, it was the wrong reason, there's no question. So you got this huge mix of all these different kinds of people and they all want to fall in love. And they all want to get married. They all just think it's wonderful. And they don't stop to think about what the whole sacrifice is involved. Because sooner or later, I love your honey pot turns into taking up the trash. And sooner or later, sometime after a while, you wake up and you look at each other and you say, my God, what did I do? And that is where the commitment of course is put to test. This is not to say that in many, many cases it should never have happened in the first place. And I have had to write at least four uh, procedures in annulment between a Lutheran and a Catholic who were getting divorced and it should be annulled. And so even the Catholic Church today allows for annulment, but simply says there was not proper cognizance of what they were doing in the first place. And there could be a variety of reasons. So even when the Catholic Church looked at all of this, they said, yeah, but we're dealing with fallen human beings. This is the way humans are. And they recognized that there was a possibility that this shouldn't have happened in the first place. Nevertheless, when all is said and done, in dealing with people who are on the verge of divorce, I have always asked this question. Did you think that when you stood and you exchanged vows that this would ever happen? And I've never heard a person say yes, they always said no. So something went wrong, and it's a tragedy in many ways. So the question is, what are you going to do with people after a tragedy when everything falls apart? And I think a Christian community has not only a right, but it has an obligation to say, we're sorry this happened but we're going to surround you with love in any way, because this is what we're called to do. All sins are forgivable except that which Jesus said 
is the sin against the Holy Spirit. So how do you sin against the Holy Spirit? First of all, why would you want to do that? But the sin against the Holy Spirit is this. Jesus says, this is unforgivable. And that is to say that the Holy Spirit is capable of doing evil. And he said, if you say that, then you're not forgiven. He's very angry. But in everything else, he does not say that forgiveness is not possible. And that is the lane that we have to drive in through life, because otherwise, we will stop and ask ourselves, why did this happen? Why did that happen? And in the intimacy of marriage, you may never, ever know. And so, let us give our brothers and sisters, the children of God, some type of benefit of the doubt that they didn't, when they first said those vows, think that they would ever be separated. And if you want to know how to do it, look at how this text closes, because for the third time in a row in these past Sundays, look who shows up at the very end. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. Why? Get rid of the kids. This is an adult conversation, moms and dads. Get rid of your kids. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. I like that. He was indignant. How dare you do these to the little ones? And he said to them, let these little ones come to me. Never stop them. For it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. For truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter into it. And he took them up into his arms, laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. And I think at certain times in our lives, when we see other people in tragedy, we would be best to be hum little children, hoping for everything, hoping that all things are possible, that forgiveness can be there, and that God truly is good, just as good as if you were a child with Jesus' arms wrapped around you, holding you tight, and saying, come on, let us try this again. I did not condemn you for all of this. And somehow, love is worth it.